Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders, the Authority Positioning Coach. Today we have with us Amanda McIntyre Chavis, who is the founder of Legend Factory. Amanda, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Mike. Thanks for having me. So I um, love when I see either someone's company name, brand name, or email address, and it just screams that there's a story behind it. So what is a Legend Factory? Okay. Well, Legend Factory is um, a brand management and development company. We focus on creatives, um, you know, creative ventures, um, and we range anywhere from working with leadership on their personal branding all the way up to uh, helping Fortune 500 companies pivot their message, uh, launch new products, etc. cetera. Um, we just love working with creatives in music and tech, um, you know, and it's just very exciting for us also to work even with, you know, smaller um, companies, startups, even down to independent artists. Um, and the reason why I decided to call it Legend Factory uh, is because we really want to help to build a legacy. Um, we yeah. really want to be a part of your family long term. And so basically, you know, that's the reason why we named it Legend Factory is because we hope to crank out some legends. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. And um, you've, you've got such a wide, diverse variety of clients that you have worked with. So I would suspect that when you're working with some of the smaller brands, you're able to draw from the successes and case studies from the larger brands. And you could even say, you know, um, here's what I recommend for your brand and here's why it will work because we just did this with XYZ Larger. Do you ever find that uh, coming up in your work with clients? Absolutely, absolutely. And vice versa, Mike. I mean, you know, it was very interesting, especially now that we're in 2020. Um, you know, you have a lot of big brands as well that are trying to break into these niche markets um, and don't necessarily have the same, uh, I'll say, huspa as some of the um, smaller companies who find ways to connect with their uh, consumers on a grassroots level. Um, because, you know, you're finding a lot of big brands as well who are trying to have a more personal relationship with their consumers and their followers and fans. Um, and so they, they, they notice that, you know, smaller guys, you know, because they don't have big, you know, big budgets and stuff like that, they've got to find unique and innovative ways to connect with their fans and find new people and new consumers. Um, so I think that, you know, in both ways we're able to use the information and our experiences on both ends to help each other. Um, you know, just as you mentioned, you know, for a small uh, brand or small company, we can certainly go to the case studies of the bigger companies. But it's a little bit different. In that case, we're helping them kind of scale up and say, okay, this is what the big guys are doing. Um, this is what has worked for them. But we also understand that certain things, it's not one size fit all, and that we won't be able to necessarily apply everything to them because they simply don't have the budget or the, the bandwidth yet to do what the big guys are doing. And that's a really, really big point. You could point to the big guys to show your brand's credibility of working with the bigger names, but you know, it, it's not as simple as taking off a few zeros off of the, you know, hey, this big uh, brand, we did this for them. They spent X. Let's just take off a few zeros and do the same for you, and it'll work the same. No, it won't. So I'm glad you brought that up. And it really is um, uh, uh, goes the other direction as well, where you know some of the smaller brands that just go, I've got to go out there and hustle and get this, you know, uh, underway, this communication, this unique engagement with my audience. And why wouldn't a larger brand be able to go, hold up, you know, we've been doing the same thing over and over again and getting okay, fine results. But what if we try something like that and start pointing to one of these, you know, smaller up and coming brands and they're getting some really big attention. Can you think of an example of when that's happened where a, a smaller mid-sized type brand is just getting stuff going? What were they doing to get some of the uh, attention with their audience? 
Well, I'm going to give you an example um, on the music side, at least. Uh, what was very interesting, so I've been following um, a company called Treble. It originally was called Treble FM, um, and now I believe it's Treble Industries, and they're doing some really interesting grassroots things um, with their fans and followers. And basically, Treble is like um, basically an app, um, but actually a movement uh, where artists, indie artists, musicians, um, and more can come together and kind of connect, so kind of like the LinkedIn for the music business, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and they're, it's an interesting combination because they're almost like a combination of LinkedIn and I would say maybe so far sound, where it's a combination of live um, performances as well as the whole app and online community. Um, and, you know, the way that they have really started to grow and, be, and became a culture and a movement um, is something that, you know, the record industry has – always invested in those type of movements. But what I realize is that you have them doing this type of thing where they're building this culture within almost, you know, this cult-like culture almost where everybody's like, wow, and they're just very supportive. And then you find companies such as a Spotify or even a Tidal who are trying to build that type of relationships with their followers and fans and their platform. Um, but, again, it does come down to, you know, the transparency and, and just being genuine, um, and that is something sometimes the bigger brands struggle with. Uh, and so, yeah. so you know, that's a, a perfect example of them kind of learning, like, hey, we're interested in watching what's happening. It's also interesting because Trouble is paying attention to these big guys and saying, yeah. okay, what are they not doing yeah. that we can do? Um, and so, you know, when I'm suggesting that to clients, I always say if you're going to – don't compare yourself to the big guys because, again – big budget, and they've been around longer, yeah. you know, so it's not the same story. So look at what they're not doing. What is it that you do really well and work on that and build on that? Because I think that people, consumers of any uh, any brand, want to interact with the brand. They don't want to be spoken at. They want to be spoken with, and I think that's a big, big piece is that engagement, to know that they're heard, even just to have interaction, you know, so maybe it's not the CEO of big brand. Maybe it's one of their VPs that is on a social media uh, a channel, you know, literally interacting with, you know, let's just use music as the example, like you've been talking about. Maybe it's like, you know what, we're looking at um, signing these artists. Here's some of their work. You know, what are you guys thinking? And I don't know that that's even feasible, but the point is here comes consumers of this uh, music label, their brand on social media, and they're going, wow, we're not just being told, here's the new artist by their stuff. We're being engaged with and what do we think and what do we like and I think that's a big piece that any size brand is missing out on right absolutely well I mean I use music as an example but to give another example as well it's almost like how Lululemon kind of came roaring into the scene um, you know when you already had Adidas and Nike and other brands athletic brands that were in that space um, you know, again, it came down to them being grassroots and getting their people out there and truthfully even getting their executives out there. Yeah. Um, it's so interesting, Mike, that you brought that up because part of what I had done, um, I, you know, I'm a former ambassador of New, uh, New York uh, Women of Wearables for New York. Um, and basically Women of Wearables is an um, uh, organization for women in wearable technology. Uh, and part of what I wanted to do as a series uh, was to bring out some of those execs from behind the desk out into the community, yeah. talk with people, do panels and things like that. Um, and that's a lot of what I suggest to clients as well at the bigger guys because, you know, there is a, a definite disconnect. You know, it's got to be more than just um, – you know, your interns or your assistants or your coordinators or whoever going out here trying things, talking, et cetera. You know, you have a lot of people who want to know what's happening with the big guys, what's happening in the C-suite. Um, and, you know, as you said, it's not always feasible. Um, but, you know, the I'll say a lot of these other brands that are having success because they are coming out from behind the big desk, you know, you, it, it's apparent in their co- company culture, and it actually yeah. trickles all the way down to the product and their relationship with the consumers as well. 
Yeah, did you ever read that book years ago by Seth Godin by the name of Tribes? Yes, absolutely. And, and one of the takeaways I remember from the book is, and I know I'm paraphrasing the, the concept, but pretty much you want to wrap your arms around your tribe, your community, your audience, your customers, and find out exactly what they like, don't like, what they want, what they wish that your product had, and then go build it and sell it to them. As opposed to building this thing, creating this thing, and then selling it to people and it falling on deaf ears. So, you know, like what we've been talking about here with these brands, how can you listen and engage with and truly get what they're looking for and then go, you know what? This is kind of close to what we have in production, but since now our audience is saying they want this aspect or this piece of it, let's now um, uh, uh, get this over to R&D, depending on the brand. Now, I think the downfall of that is you then could have all, you can't listen to everybody because now it's going to be all over the place and, and you'll be running around in circles trying to give this person that thing. So you've got to have control when you're now reaching out to and listening to your audience. Is that something that you've seen in in the industries that you work in as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, that's it's, and especially when it comes down to retail because, you know, yeah. you have that, that, that fast retail, um, which also means fast turnover. Um, you know, so, yeah, you can't listen to everything. I mean, I think more importantly, more so than just the feedback, it's about the engagement. Um, and this is a lot of what I talk to them about is, you know, it, Yes, you can't chew every piece of feedback that you get back, um, but, you know, you have to be listening in the first place. I think the core part of it is to be listening and engaging, um, you know, and hearing what's going on, you know, and then kind of working through all of those bits and pieces, the data that you're getting, the, the A and B testing that you're doing, you know, the focus group, stuff like that. These are tools that I think a lot of big box brands are getting back to, uh, you know, is certainly something I suggest uh, for startups and, and you know, small to mid-sized companies all the time. Do some A-B testing. See what's happening. Find your audience, you know, um, because, again, this is about being having that long tail and being around for a while. Um, and, the, and that's the problem with a lot of the big brands that tried to go fast retail and kept cranking out things. Um, at the end of the day, it didn't really help their bottom line, um, and then they end up suffering in major ways, and it trickled all the way up to uh, down to the, down to their employees, you know, um, yeah. because now they've lost a lot of money, and you know it affects the workforce, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so just being really smart about those type of decisions um, and understanding that it really is more about the engagement than necessarily giving everybody what they're wishing for is <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> probably the best way to go about it. Yeah, that's a really good point. Hey, speak a little bit about women in, you know, you work a lot with women in technology, women in music, women in wearables, like you mentioned. What's the, uh, what are you seeing out there in the landscape of business? Why, why is, is there a need to focus on women in these certain verticals? Oh, wow. I mean, because, you know, for the longest time, truthfully, it was very difficult to be heard. Um, you know, and so we're in a stage now where we're being heard. There's a lot more work to be done. Um, you know, we are naturally creative in a lot of different ways from the home to, to the boardroom. Um, and so, you know, again, it, it all comes down to the diversity and inclusion, being able to have multiple voices and being able to find multiple solutions. Um, and, you know, w women, we, we tend to know how to juggle plenty. <laughs> we, we wear many hats throughout the day. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, you know, just w being involved with women in, in everything, as you mentioned, women in music, women in tech, uh, women in wearables, um, you know, that's just kind of a part of my, my own personal fra fabric as well, um, is in embracing and endorsing other women um, in the space. Uh, I think it's very important for the voice to be, continue to be heard. Uh, and, yes, it is a movement now, but I hope that it will be just, you know, a second it shouldn't be a second thought. It should be automatic. It shouldn't have to be a movement, so to speak. Um, and I think it's going to take a while before we get there, but, you know, it's, it's really important that we're involved in this way so that we do take those steps to make it a part of the weave and fabric of the workforce uh, and business in general. 
Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. And, and I think it, it just kind of, we, we, uh, we didn't plan on talking about this aspect, but it just seems to keep coming up and up and up with engagement. With, when you're focusing on women in whatever, you know, that, that vertical would be, it's that engagement and that collaboration. And it could be men in, it could be teenagers in, it could be whatever you want, but it just now starts to build that tribe of like-minded people in that specific industry. So I think that's awesome. What are you seeing in, in the, uh, let's just say 2020 and beyond, you know, this is uh, 2020 and you think about it that with vision, you know, Oh, hindsight's 2020 and laser focus. What are you seeing? Some of the focus um, in business should be, is going to be here in this year and beyond. Well, it's so funny because um, my mantra for this year is hindsight and foresight is 2020. Yeah. Um, and the reason why, I came up with this mantra is because, um, yes, we're building towards the future. We're here in the present. We're building towards the future. But we also have to look to the past so that we don't, you know, continue the same mistakes, learn from those things. Um, And this year I truly believe that people are looking at these things and we're building, um, you know, for the future. We're building in, in, in a very in a different way, I think personally. I mean, my personal opinion is is that we're becoming a bit more transparent. We're trying. We're really trying to say, hey, you know, all of these movements and different things shouldn't just be a movement. It should be more of the norm. You know, just as you mentioned, um, you know, teens in, men in, women in, you know, et cetera. Again, it all starts from having a conversation. This is reason why we're seeing these movements is to engage and to have a conversation um, so that it becomes the norm, you know. Um, it's kind of like when we, di- we didn't have these smartphones. The smartphones weren't, weren't the norm back then, yeah. you know. Um, you know so having a cell phone wasn't the norm, and now you're living in a smart home, and that seems yeah. to be the norm. Um, and so that's, that's the reason, that's what's interesting to me. I believe that we're going to be more interconnected. I believe that, you know, as the years are coming forward, I would hope that we become more social. Um, you know, again, we have social media, and it's great to be able to connect with people all over the world. Um, but in some cases, some of these tools have made us more antisocial, in my humble opinion. Um, yes. Oh, yeah. And so, we could go another four hours on that one point yeah. alone, which, which we won't, but that's a, yes. that's a mouthful right there. <laughs> yes. So, you know, I think that we're going to be more interconnected. I feel like we're going to see some more um, creative solutions in business in the sense of everything from wearables to fashion to our lifestyle, um, you know, connections and stuff like that. I think that we are going to be seeing a lot more startups and, and more collaborations between small and me- medium-sized businesses and big corporations because, again, there are certain things that small and medium-sized businesses can do and get away with that big box can't. Um, you know, so I, I'm excited to see where it's going. I also yeah. believe that there's going to be a few big guys that won't, won't be around this time next year. Um, and the reason being is because they were built on an old model um, and unfortunately didn't really, you know, work on the scale up of things, yeah. the scalability or um where really? they kept doing things the way they've always done, and who cares? You know, we're, exactly. we're not looking at, you know, what's going on. And perfect example, Blockbuster Netflix, you know, I mean, it was just unbelievable yes. to see that, you know, uh, uh, Netflix talk about, oh, please buy us out, buy us out. And Blockbuster's like, no, that's dumb. I'm not going to do, uh, you know, online digital m- movies by mail. And then Blockbuster goes out, and now Netflix is the behemoth that they are. So Absolutely. I think that's really insightful. In, and I'm not going to ask you to name companies that you're going to predict are going to go under, because I know <laughs> that we, we can. At the end of this year, we can look back and go, okay, of these companies that were in the news about going under, why was it? And I think it's going to be they didn't keep up with the times and they didn't see what uh, uh, issues were as they were scaling up. So I think that's super, super powerful. Any yeah, final I, thoughts um, that you would like to make? And then how can people reach out and connect with you through Legend Factory? Yes, absolutely. Well, just to piggyback off really quickly what you said, you know, mm-hmm. so the retail is a perfect example of that. You have a bunch of retailers right now that are closing their brick-and-mortar stores. 
Um, when, in fact, you know, if it came down to me I and they came to me for my advice, I would have said, let's repurpose those locations. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, but again, <laughs> just my humble opinion, uh, you know, I, my final thoughts would be, you know, as you're, st- whether you're a big corporation brand or whether you're a small guy, you know, pay attention to your consumers and your fans, try to have more engagement, um, and make sure that you're building with flexibility so that as these changes happen with technology, the way that your consumers are, you know, purchasing and things like that, you're able to move with the times and you're not so rigid um, because that could be a game changer for you and your brand. Um, the best way that they, should I tell them the best way they can reach me? And Yeah, what's the, um, do you like social media? Do you like your website? What uh, What's the best way to interact with your brand? Okay, so social media wise, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, you can uh, catch me at Amanda McChavis. Um, I can spell that out if you like. Amanda A M A N D A Mick M C Chavis C H A V I S um, on all platforms. Okay, so it could be twitter.com slash Amanda McChavis on all platforms. Uh, you can also go to Legend Factory, all one word, dot co. Um, Legend Factory is all one word, uh, dot co on everything as well, Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera. And uh, if you'd like to reach out to us directly and send an email, you can send it to info at legendfactory.co. Awesome. Well, Amanda, thank you so much for coming on today. It was really fun talking about brands and engagement and then what's to come. So I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Mike. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.